You're listening to the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, and we are proud to welcome back returning sponsor, Onares. Providing a powerful and flexible system for managing vacation rental properties, Onares provides booking and maintenance management, payment scheduling and collection, as well as insightful reporting. Onares will provide you with a long-term booking foundation that is scalable for your vacation rental business while fully managing your channel listings, but still focusing on your brand, your website, and your way of doing things. If you sign up now using the promotional code VRF30, that's VRF30, you can get 30% off your first three months. Make sure you listen into the mid-episode break where you'll hear some great testimonials about Onares and more about this incredible company. For more information about Onares, click in the link in the description of this episode on your smart device. Let's get started. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Today, I'm taking you inside the world of short-term rental journalism, Paul Stevens is the editor of Short Term Rentals at International Hospitality Media, and he reports on the industry across the world, giving him a much wider perspective that few of us have. And we're talking about the differences and the commonalities of a global business and touching on things that impact you all. So I hope you enjoy this great conversation. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information, and resources on this rapidly changing short term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new, and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer, and as ever, I am super delighted to be back with you once again. And as I record this, it is super hot outside, and I am really quite enjoying it for once, sitting down in my basement, even with the lights that I have over towards the other side of me. So because we do video these conversations, I'm not sure if you realize that, but all of our podcasts go onto YouTube. And, you know, if you want to see who I'm talking to, we're not going to get much of a glimpse of my studio. (laughs) You will see where I'm working from. And I know that some people quite enjoy to actually listen to a podcast and also to see the people who are chatting to each other. So for sure, go on over to YouTube and check out the recordings of all our podcasts. They're all out there and on there. So I got to thinking the other day about the concept of parochialism and what parochialism is. It's a reference to a a narrow-minded or limited view of the world, which, as ChatGPT told me, often stems from a lack of exposure to or consideration of diverse ideas, cultures or perspectives. It can manifest as a form of bias or prejudice, as individuals may be inclined to judge or evaluate things solely based on their own experiences and beliefs without taking into account a broader context. I relate to this because when we were running our business here in Ontario, we often forgot that we were part of a much wider North American business. And we tended to think it was very unique and different. But it wasn't until I started going to conferences and networking with people that I, I realized that there is this, this wider perspective on the business. And there's, there's people everywhere who are doing exactly the same things and experiencing the same issues and maybe managing them in different ways. And that was a lot of the learning that I took on by talking to people about the different ways that they did deal with and handle things that came their way in our business. And I think this impacts many of us, particularly if we operate our businesses in in one area, that we can have a really more of a limited perspective. You know, there's an emphasis on our own locality or group And we're not as open or aware of broader perspectives or diversity in terms of of many things, in terms of, you know, where our guests come from, where our owners come from and where our vendors and the people who work for us come from. So I'm not suggesting in any sense that we are all narrow minded or self-centred. 
But when we're immersed in our businesses on a day-to-day basis, it's so easy not to look outside our immediate box and see what's happening in the wider world. So I've been going to conferences for years, and it was at one of these conferences I first met Paul Stevens from Short Term Rentals. It was at Host 2019 in London. So it was in the November, you know, a couple of months before the pandemic broke out. And it was a brilliant show. I loved it. There was something really different about it. But anyway, sadly, the pandemic put a hold on any more shows like that from from that same company that produced Host 2019. But, you know, with the proliferation of conferences, summits, retreats, hosting events, we aren't actually short of choices. And how to choose between them all is challenging. You know, I love to talk about conferences and I will be talking to Paul about that. But also I get his thoughts on a range of topics that impact us from a global as well as a local perspective. So without further ado, let's uh, move on over to my interview with Paul Stevens from Short Term Rentals. So I'm super delighted to have with me today Paul Stevens, who is the editor of Short Term Rentals at International Hospitality Media. This is such fun, Paul, because we met back in... 2019 at uh, yeah. <laughs> host 2019, which seems like eons ago. It's a whole pandemic ago. And we, we sort of very briefly talked then, but we had a much better discussion when we were in Barcelona um, a month or so back. So you interviewed me for short-term rentals. So I'm getting my <laughs> own back now. And, and I know this is probably a little bit unusual for you to be on the other side of the microphone. So welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, honestly, really flattered to be uh, on this podcast as well. And so close as well to your, your 500th episode. So congratulations on <laughs> all the success and um, shows the respect the industry has for you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Yeah, hitting that hitting that milestone was uh, was <laughs> something else. And I, and I sort of re- reflected back, oh my gosh, it's nine years since we started this and we have not yeah. missed a week in nine years. And I, I envy some of the podcasters who do, well, I'll do a season of 10 episodes and then I'll take five <laughs> weeks off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know that feeling as well. But it's funny you, you mentioned that introduction there. But I, I think when we spoke in Barcelona, we couldn't quite remember where we'd where we'd met each other before. <laughs> yes. we, we knew what we had, but we couldn't remember <laughs> the event. So, um, And that, that host 2019 was, so, I, I don't know, there was something about it. I don't know if you felt the same because you go to a lot of conferences. There just seemed something about it that was that was different. It was vibrant and they had all the little educational stuff, but it, it was it was almost, um, so the exhibitors were in the middle and the education was around the edges, like mm. it was a little bit different from um, from what we, we normally see. What did you think about that one? Um yeah, I mean, host feels like such um, a, a long time ago, as you mentioned, that was 2019 prior to the pandemic. And you think of all the other topics that have sprung up or the speakers that have emerged. I just remember this was a, I think it was a one day conference. And I just remember the absolute buzz mm. um, in, in London. And that was, again, before anything where, you know, we'd gone six months without being able to see each other or just talk on on zoom like we're like we're doing now but I think that's given the framework for people to look at um you know what other events um can do really within the space we have these breakout stages and you know the the networking and I think that that's really what sort of stands out with a lot of Mm -hmm. these events as well everyone always tells me the, the networking is is the key thing that they're there for and that's almost covers the entrance fee really but I think as time's gone on as well the the quality of, of the agendas and you know being able to think outside of the box sort of evade maybe the the mm-hmm. usual carousel of people that you get in the industry talking and, and look further afield I think people really really value those insights as well. Well you I mean you organize events we're going to come on and talk a little bit more about the short-term rentals events a bit later on but Forgive me. I haven't even introduced you really. Um, you know, you are you're you're the editor of Short Term Rentals. You're a journalist. What got you into this current role? 
because I, I saw, I looked through your LinkedIn profile and you'd, you'd done some stuff, <laughs> you'd done a month internship in the, with the Telegraph in their sports division. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> what, give us the backstory. Yeah, actually, actually, it was just it was just a week on the Telegraph. Oh, right, but, um, you can you can literally <laughs> put a, put a week in the LinkedIn profile. But yeah, that that came back actually through a a contact through through my family and um, me being a big sports fan as I am. I mean, football and tennis are really my two of my big passions um, in life. And it was um, the week that I got to do the, the Telegraph was the week the week that the football season was starting up again, or soccer, as as um, some of your um, uh, <laughs> listeners will, will be uh, will use that term. Um, but the season was starting up again, and and they effectively asked me, "Would you like to do a couple of previews for the football season?" And I, of course, I was not really going to refuse that opportunity. So I got, I think, three bylines in, in the space of a week, and if we just got as many uh, many um, additions as we could, just pick them off the tables, and that just gave me such a such a buzz, really, to to be part of um, journalism. And um, I remember the Ashes was on, and, and the Ashes is on at the moment, the cricket. But I think sport and, and travel. I think when I left university, because uh, I'm, I'm actually a languages graduate and I studied French and Spanish, so it was quite a a natural progression really into into travel but I always knew it was going to be travel or, or sport and uh, I guess here we are now. Actually I d- suddenly realised we have so much in common so I'm learning Spanish Duolingo the Duolingo Excellent. message on a 61 day streak <laughs> now so I've got 500 words. Uh, <laughs> What's your record though? My, my, oh I don't I don't know I'm not paying much attention to those <laughs> to those stats. Football. I've just finished the entire season of Ted Lasso, so I know everything about football. And, and as far as tennis is concerned, I'm sorry, I'm a pickleball player. <laughs> so, let's go back. Let's, lots, in, lots, in common. lots in common. So let's go back to rentals. So what got you to short term rentals then? What was yeah, it that came so, out and said, oh, yeah, let's go into this industry? I think everyone says and across the 500 or 501, 502 episodes that you've done, I would be sure that a lot of your guests would have said that they've kind of fallen into this space by accident. I mean, I'm, I'm quite young. I'm, I'm I'm 28, and it was only how many years ago? Five years, six years ago, I, I graduated from university, had a four-year course, so I was studying uni for three of those years. I had a year in in France as well, part of my degree. Came out of university like a lot of people, not really quite sure what I wanted to do, and it feels like such a big decision, you know, making the first step into into your career, really. And so I did a couple of internships and just really trying to get myself on the ladder in journalism, which is, as we know, very difficult to do. So I did a sort of a, a short course, really, in journalism for, for six months in, in Brighton here in, in the south of England. And that equipped me with, I think, a lot of the skills that I've been able to take um, forward maybe not so much shorthand, but, um, you know, things like, you know, just how to structure stories and how to interview people and all sorts of different skills. And um, within a month of finishing the course, I was just looking, looking around and and trying to see opportunities that would, would be of interest. And I landed on here at International Hospitality Media. And for those who don't know us, we've got these four B2B hospitality, travel and real estate segment website. So we've got short-term rentals that everyone knows about with a, with Z at the end. And uh, we've got boutique hotel news, service department news and urban living news. So really covering the, the broad landscape of uh, travel, hospitality and real estate. And um, at the time, short-term rentals was were just starting out and they wanted someone to come in and, and launch that. And here we are now coming up to five years later and I can honestly say it's been such a whirlwind when you consider that you know we've gone through pandemic we've gone through you know ge- geopolitical but, um, you know businesses shutting we've, it's a really difficult time but at, at the same time we've possibly been able to position ourselves as quite a respected source in the in the industry and love getting the opportunity to meet new people and, and get the chance to converse with you as well. 
<laughs> so I think short-term rentals may not be as well known in the in the US as as maybe mm. other short-term rental news publications. So I want this out there for people to go to short-term rentals because I guess I've been doing this for about a year and every so often I land on the page and I start reading through mm. some of the articles and there's such a wide perspective across the globe because you cover mm. from Asia and Europe yeah. and the North Americas and just everything that happens across the world. And it really is interesting to see the commonalities between us all. You know, we're not much different, whether we're operating, you know, a, a small property management company in Delaware or something in Sydney, Australia. I completely agree, Heather. And, um, you know, one, one of the things with, with short-term rentals and that we've really tried to push maybe as we've grown our presence more in, in the States and attending more events is there's still in, in some ways this perception that we're, because we're UK based, that we cover UK stories and we cover mm -hmm. Europe. And I think if people really take the time to, to look, I mean, we've covered stories just this week in, you know, regulations in, in Malaysia, we've covered Sweden, we've covered Saudi Arabia. There's something happening everywhere in the world. And I could honestly write, you know, double, triple the number of stories that I do, but definitely some some commonalities. And, and we, we can talk about some of those as well in, in this interview. But every every market is also distinct in its own way. And I think it, it needs that representation on the media stage, on events as well. And I mean, our audience is actually 60% US based. Uh -huh. I think a lot of that comes down to just the, the, the stories that you're covering in, in that, that region and, and the sheer volume of people. But we're part of a much wider industry. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to keep growing and keep providing coverage of these markets. Yeah, it's in the introduction I talked about this this new term of mine, parochialism, where, <laughs> where we uh, we tend <laughs> where we tend to concentrate on the, you know the, the local aspect, the things that are going on in our immediate surroundings, and not looking outside. And I think it, it really is important to to understand mm. that that it is this wider view of the, you know, the the industry goes much wider than than where we currently are. I wanted to get your thoughts on something that's happening in it seems to be percolating at the moment, and I don't know if it's going to do a percolate and then blow up. <laughs> I mean, how do do percolators blow up? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> what seems to be coming up is a divide between the professional property managers and hosts and what are we calling ourselves? Are we calling ourselves short-term rentals? Are we calling ourselves vacation rentals or holiday lets? I don't know if you've listened to any of the recent podcasts, the panel that Will Slickers did, um, did yeah. which was interesting. I'll put a link to these on the show notes. <laughs> the No BS podcast yeah. where they interviewed Bill Faith. That was a really interesting one because that sort of, got me thinking, oh, this is percolating you know, <laughs> quite, quite strongly now in terms of what we are calling ourselves. Mm. Now, you went to Skift recently mm. in New York. Yeah. How would you describe Skift before I go on? How would you describe it? As a, as, a, as, a, as a publication as a, yeah. or as a... An yeah, it's a travel... Um, is it, is it yes, aimed at travel I, executives? I, I, so it's... it's pretty much a business intelligence platform right. I, I guess they would say and um whereas short-term rentals is is solely in focusing on short-term rentals mm -hmm. in, in all different parts of the world i guess skift possibly does it on like a, a broader scale but right. they're looking at different travel verticals as well so airlines um tours and activities which is a really interesting space right now as well and um Yes. So, so did you see? Did did this come up at all in discussion while you're at Skift? In that, you know, with that slightly different audience, they had so many presentations throughout the day covering so many different topics, and it comes actually now as we're trying to organise our own agenda mm -hmm. for a, a summit in in October. But I think you're absolutely right about what exactly do we call this industry right now? What might have started out as short term rentals vacation rentals now you're starting to see some blurring of the lines really and you've got these terms such as flexible rentals coming up as well and 
you know, what even is a short term rental now? That's almost <laughs> the hardest question in this industry. What what was thirty days or, or or less could could be interpreted in in different ways now? And of course, you know, with our websites as well, we're looking at this convergence and blending between asset classes and service departments and on the urban side as well. But it's interesting, and I, I, I'm not sure what, what, what you think about it. But I think on the on the if you ask regulators, I think they would see short term rentals and, and vacation rentals. They probably group them together as as the same thing or something, and they're just thinking that this is, you know, they're all, all the same properties and creating disruption in neighbourhoods, but it's much wider in, in reality as we know. And in terms of if you're looking at guest demographics or if you're looking at length of stay and the sort of rise of workations and staycations as well. Yeah, that's interesting because the pandemic brought out, you know, the um, you know, digital nomads and the you know, longer yeah. workations. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. But, I, you know, I have to say, if, if we had to change the name, then both you and I are in a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah, ex- exactly. Um, I mean, we'd, we'd kind of have to st- stick with the Z as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's interesting. I was, I did, um, veering off topic slightly here, but I did a story about a company called Thinking Traveller a couple of weeks ago, and it's a a luxury villa rental company here in Europe, and some people may know it. And it was interesting that they had kind of undergone this brand refresh where they were essentially taking out the word rental from their branding and marketing. And it just sort of got me thinking whether that word rental now is almost, I don't want to say a taboo words but maybe people are going to start shifting away from that and we're going to see new terms popping up all the time that that's an interesting one i hadn't thought about that i'm actually on the thinking traveler website it's not it's not um oh, uh, we met the founder at skipped actually and interesting enough just walked right <laughs> past us so um if if hugh is is watching this then it was great to meet you <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah, I'll take a look at that because that's a really interesting topic, that whole, you know, take rental out of it. Not going there. (laughs) Not going there right now. Um, You need a whole other podcast for that. (laughs) Yeah, but that, uh, you know, the... It it will be interesting to see how this moves on, you know. Will we be changing the way, you know, what we call ourselves? I just hope we don't end up saying, okay, let's let's get rid of vacation rentals and short-term rentals and holiday lets, and we'll just call ourselves Airbnbs. (laughs) <laughs> mm. Yes, and I, I, we we know that there's this big move trying to stop this homogenization of calling short term rentals Air, Airbnbs, and I guess and, and some people could feel completely different about this, but I guess that probably the the crux of what the industry is getting at will always remain. But it's just going to evolve over time, as, mm-hmm. as it's probably done over the last ten, twenty even three years if we look at the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will put links to both the Will Slickers panel and the No BS podcast episode with Bill Faith, because as I say, that was, that was an interesting one. I, I did wonder after that whether I should start you know, dropping F-bombs throughout my podcast. <laughs> Is that going to get me a lot more listeners? <laughs> I'll, I'll try and keep the expletives on the, on the down this time. Yeah, yeah but both, both of those um, both of those episodes are really you know, make make really good listens and and really get you thinking about what's happening outside hmm. your local business. We're going to take a short break just now to hear about our sponsor Onares directly from one of their clients. We'll be back to our interview in just a few moments. Hi, my name is Dave Bruder, and along with my wife, we own and manage a total of four vacation rentals between the beautiful Smoky Mountains in Tennessee and the sunny beaches of Siesta Key, Florida. We've been operating for 10 years and using Onares about seven years now, and Onares has truly transformed the way we grow and manage our vacation rental business. When we started adding more properties, we quickly realized that manual tasks were becoming our biggest obstacle. That's where Onares stepped in, and it made all the difference. With its advanced features and automation, Onares has saved us countless hours of manual work. From guest communication to automated processes, Onares has become the backbone of our vacation rental operations 
and Book Direct strategy. Onares powers a seamless and professional booking experience directly through our website. One of the standout features of Onares is its powerful channel management system. Having a single dashboard to manage availability, rates, discounts, and content across multiple channels has been a game changer. I can't imagine trying to make updates for our four properties across six different channels without the efficiency and control provided by Onares. Moreover, their seamless integration with third-party companies to manage things such as door lock automation and cleaning apps has further streamlined our operations. Throughout our journey, the Onares team has been there for us, providing excellent support whenever we needed help. Their support articles are detailed and well-written, making it easy to find solutions for any questions or challenges we encountered. Additionally, their commitment to being open and transparent is evident through their enhancements in communication and engagement with the user community. They listen, track feature requests publicly, provide valuable feedback, and genuinely care about their user experience and our ability to conduct business with our guests. In all honesty, I cannot recommend Onares highly enough. It's been an invaluable platform that has made managing and growing our vacation rental business a breeze. If you're looking for a comprehensive and reliable solution, Onares is the way to go. Well, that was a great testimonial. And now back to our interview. Let's move on to the Shorties Awards, because this is something that's developed over the last couple of years, and it really took off this year. So can you tell us what the Shorties Awards are and, uh, and where they're going? Yeah, so it's funny now. When, when I go to events or, or speak to people, sometimes more people have heard about the shorties than our actual website which is quite an interesting (laughs) phenomenon but um yeah essentially the shorties awards are global award ceremony in person we hope for the global short-term vacation rental industry and we started it back in uh well 2020 would you believe we had the um the first edition of the awards (laughs) In March 2020, and very very lucky to get it in. We did it on a on a boat cruising down the the Thames, and I think that really set the tone for the the next few years. Really, it, it's a different type of award ceremony where it, it's not a black tie, it's not an incredibly formal type of event. We will change the location each year to have something that's completely unique and and memorable. Mm-hmm. In, in some ways, it is like us being a host for, for guests as well, because we've, we've had people, we've had the awards on a boat. We've, the second year we were in lockdown, so we had to record the whole thing on Zoom. The third year, we were on a rooftop balcony overlooking the Tower of London. This year, we were at the um, big orbit sculpture outside the uh, Olympic Stadium. So that's something that's quite quite big for us. But we have these 20 categories. There'll be a couple of minor changes and tweaks each year, but um, essentially the awards are open for everyone really within the industry, covering hosts, property managers like of, all, of all sorts as well, um, of urban or leisure markets. We've got categories for channel managers, booking platforms, membership platforms, um, glamping camping type providers as well so we've tried to create an awards that is as diverse and inclusive as possible and I think looking back to 2019 when my boss and I sort of co-conceived this idea it was we just thought why is there not an award ceremony that is synonymous now with 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 the industry and I guess you know we just had that had that moment of, of thinking about it and we're a year into, into the website and I guess it's gone from strength to strength. We've had, we had almost 400 entries this year. We had I think about 60,000 votes in five days. So it's, it's just really captured the uh, imagination of the industry. I, I would hope that uh, a lot more people will continue to, to get involved. So you say you had a lot of votes. Where, so, so how, how are they judged? Because yeah, I, so, I, I see some of these, you know, there the have been awards out there yeah. and it's just like people get out and say, everybody vote for me and keep voting and sure. you can have as many votes as you can press the button. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think perhaps 
to, to some degree, initially there's some some cynicism based perhaps on people's traditional perception of awards that it is always sponsors and people's friends, mm-hmm. etc. winning. So we very much tried to eliminate any type of bias and we've got a judging panel again that changes each year and um, we try and get a, a broad range of perspectives as well. So each judge hugely experienced and a diverse range of individuals again from short-term rentals and broader hospitality landscape as well they'll typically be judging maybe two or three categories before we advance to a a shortlist stage and that's really when you start seeing all the buzz on social media Mm -hmm. and people they want to shout about making a shortlist which is a big achievement in itself and then ultimately the the winners would be decided by a 50 50 split between the judge scores and and the public vote and I, th- I think we've come across a, a kind of model that is is fair and reflective of, of the companies and, and individuals that deserve to win. There could be so many deserving winners each year, but mm-hmm. um, I, I hope people appreciate what we're trying to do. And each year we're, we're learning and improving. But um, I, I, I think, and I hope we're we're onto something good there as well. So, when is the next uh, Shorties Award taking place? So I don't know if we have. A full confirmation of dates yet yeah. um i would probably have to ask someone else that but i think we're looking at april 2024 uh, right. in london which will be the the fifth edition and we timed this around another event in london called the short stay summit and again diane mike um merrily the sta vrma and ehha all of these organizations coming together to create this and so People can come from further afield. We've had people from Australia, New Zealand, as far as field as those. We had lots of South Africans coming over to London this time as well. So it's a really hugely um, creative mix of, of people and different industry leaders and, of course, the, the networking, which is um, important as well. I think, can, can we actually say on the podcast that I think we've got it confirmed that you're going to be a judge <laughs> Uh, for 2024 as well so this this is probably the first time that we're we can uh, announce that oh well so thank very you happy to have you oh on. I'm delighted I really am delighted I'll, I'll look forward to it very much and uh, you know it's a good excuse to come to London <laughs> absolutely absolutely and, and a- April that the weather the weather is is good as well and um, if it's anything like it is today then um, yes it, it's it's a great time of, of year and there's a lot of other events happening in Europe in in the days and, and weeks after that so well that's people yeah I think, want to... I think that's an that's an important point because I wanted to come on to this you go to a lot of conferences now um I don't know if host 2019 was the first one you went to but you know now you you go to many <laughs> <laughs> well the, so the first one I actually went to was a hotel event in Paris but um the first industry event I can remember maybe Kigo World in All right. 2019 so Again, that that feels like quite quite an age ago. There, that's that's four years already. Um, but yeah, we we get to go to a couple more more events now and enjoy it. Yeah. So, what you you go to all these events? We talked about Skift being a very different conferences. What stands each one apart? Do you think? I mean, we were at the short stay week in Barcelona, which I absolutely loved. Absolutely. And Damien and Gian pa- Paolo did such an amazing job with their team, just putting on something together, which was different conferences every day. It's like doing mm. five conferences in I one en- week. I can envy their, their <laughs> situation, but to be fair to them, fantastic job. And I yeah. um, loved it. Would highly recommend your your audience to and, attend. And that, yes, yeah, absolutely. And But that was a very different from what you might experience at a VRMA conference, very different from what you'd experience at the short-term rental wealth conference, which I haven't been to, but I certainly have heard about, which is you no know, more, I, d- I don't know how to describe it because I haven't been there, but it sounds, it sounds different. So what stands each apart from the other? Do you have to go, do you think, with a, with a different mindset for each one? Um, oh, it's funny because I, I remember in our interview at the short stay week, you called you called the event VRMA on steroids, <laughs> um, which I absolutely love. We'll definitely use that that quote again. But 
I think it is good that every event has its own representation and, and, and stands out and differentiates itself against the rest. Because if everyone tried to copy each other with the location or with mm-hmm. the types of sessions or formats, then that would be boring. I'm, I'm not sure everyone would then necessarily want to attend. I think ultimately kind of what probably some some foundations that you need at every event you need plenty of networking um, opportunities and we're starting to see more you know bonding activities as well besides that so at uh, in Barcelona there was a there was a boat event the, the the night the night before the final day I was there and that was fantastic and, and just getting people outside of those different settings really um, so you don't have to always talk business I think that that's increasingly important and people value being around each other and having high quality conversations as well. Mm -hmm. I'd say now something that helps industry events to really stand out as well, high quality, high caliber speakers, but also the opportunity to provide a platform to create, establish, forge new thought leaders really within the space. Mm -hmm. And I think if, we talk about industry representation and having diversity on stage. I think the the organisers, inclu- including myself, need to look beyond um, the the figures that we see on a lot of these panels as well, and you know just just look to have a good variety of people who are experienced and, and you can rely on 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 their expertise. But also, what does a new property manager or host mm-hmm. or tech provider or uh, I mean also analyst um all, all sorts of people what what perspective can can they bring and this industry is so accepting that people will will listen to you know newcomers and and, and they'll want to learn from them so yeah hopefully that, that sums it up quite quite well yeah I've um, you know the, re- the reason I called it VRMA on steroids was because it sort of separated out all the the different types of host or property manager. So I know Verma have gone to talking about, you know, welcoming smaller managers, but I've spoken to smaller managers who said they went there and they just didn't feel that, you know, they didn't feel that welcome. Whereas the short stay week was, you know, you had the, the book direct show where there were a lot of independent hosts as well as small managers, and then scale rentals, which welcomed smaller managers one day and then the bigger managers the next way. And it's it's sort of, to me, it just blended. It it was like a progression of, you know, how we are going through the industry. And I think that was great for the people to see that at the start, to see, you know, where they could go. And there was a great calibre of of vendors. It wasn't just, it wasn't overborn with vendors. The ones who were there were you know, highly respected vendors and they just seem to come with a different attitude as well. Mm, that, mm. Maybe that was just me. Because you, you went to uh, Las Vegas VRMA, VRMA International, am I right? But you, you've been, you've been in, in other years as well. How, how have you seen... <laughs> How have you seen that progress? Oh, I've, I've been, been going to, well. yeah, I've been going to the VRMA International Conference since around 2012, I think. Been to a lot of them and they're, they're just so massive now. And, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you could you need an aircraft hangar for the exhibitor <laughs> space, which in itself is okay. You know, if you want to go and it, it's like going into a massive mall, or, it, it or was, just was, scrolling through like, Amazon. Really. Yeah, <laughs> Las, Las Vegas was my first experience of a VRMA international as well. And you're, you're only sort of hearing about, hearing stories from other people about what, what it's actually like. And nothing can really quite prepare you for 2,000 people in, mm-hmm. in the same room. And, um, you know, I, I think we obviously want to increase our presence in the States and be attending more events. And I think also when we attend other events as well, you, you're looking at what, what works, maybe what, what doesn't work so well and really how you can improve and, and maybe also differentiate yourself from, from other events in the market. But I, I believe I'm going uh, back to uh, VRMA uh, International this year and fortunately I've been given my first 
opportunity to, to speak on a panel as well. So excellent. Um, I'm looking looking forward to that, and yeah, hopefully there'll be a lot more um, people coming over from from Europe or, or other parts of the world. It was it was an amazing experience. Yeah, I, I will be in Orlando too. I'm on a panel as well. So yes, we will, we will get to uh, to to speak in person again. I want to sort of go back a bit to what we were talking about at the beginning. So we talk about commonalities and differences. Well, we talked a little bit about differences, but you've got a session at the Short-Term Rentals Summit in London with the working title at the moment of Sustainable Hospitality, Unlimited Desire versus Limited Mm. Resources. And I wanted to bring up this topic of sustainability because Mm. I believe it's a massive topic going forward in this industry. Booking.com have been doing surveys for the past couple of years on sustainability. The stats which they are bringing up saying, you know, people are booking more sustainable properties and they're actually going out and looking for them now. And of course, with the you know, real pioneering work that Bob Garner and Deborah Larby doing that, and Vanessa de Souza Large, of course, with Sustonica. So there's some pretty powerful voices now in mm. this world of sustainability. And I wanted to ask you that with all your connections across the world, seeing what's going on, how important do you feel that the whole sustainability issue is going forward to 2024 Mm. and beyond? Well, I guess firstly, I should say, actually, it's great to see. I mean, Bob is, I think, the ultimate or the the real crusader for this. And Mm -hmm. now we're starting to see more people listening and and highlighting sustainability and, and creating businesses that revolve around this as well. So, we feel that it's a responsibility of of us as a as a media publication to be covering it in in our publication and following through with that on on events as well. So you mentioned so we we've currently got this working title of sustainable hospitality, unlimited desire versus limited resources, and I guess intentionally we've we've tried to create quite an intriguing or eye catching headline there and there may still be some some tweaks to that but at at the crux of it really what we want to show is that we want to necessarily perhaps cut some of the bs and really show that now is the time to take take action and putting sustainability really at the heart of our agenda and being a, a key topic and we want to actually show businesses how they can take meaningful action and for companies that are going to be represented on stage, they'll have the opportunity to talk about how they're weighing up the the cost and benefit and, and really testing how far they are committed to working mm-hmm. and, and promoting sustainability. Because as we all know, there are issues with some some greenwashing as, as well. And I, I think we can have a really impactful conversation um, in London. So, yeah, I hope people are looking forward to that. Yeah, it's um, I've I, th- I think I've interviewed Bob and I've interviewed Vanessa on the show relatively recently. I mean, it's great to see that those initiatives that seem to have started with Bob before the pandemic and yeah. he has just kept with it and worked mm. at it and worked really, really hard to bring Enviro Rental to us. There will be a link to Enviro Rental in the show notes as well, because that's in, and, and of course, a link to Sustonica. And, and I'll put a link to Deborah's um, new course as well, because it's, it's, it's something that is very dear to my heart. I live in an area where there's a lot of greenwashing going on. Um, you know, people talk about being sustainable and, and op- adopting sustainable practices but it's there's a lot of talk and not nowhere near enough actual mm. action so uh, so it will be interesting to see how how this goes on going mm. forward so let's just uh, before we finish paul just talk about you know any more commonalities that you see between all these the you know, what appear to be different operations throughout the world regulations i mm. guess is one of them we're all impacted yeah. by regulations how how is that showing up in different areas? You mentioned um, Malaysia yeah. earlier on. I mean, regu- regulations is one of the most prescient, pressing issues in in the whole industry right now, and 
I guess all of you or all of the listeners will probably be experiencing some sort of regulations or hearing through through the grapevine about things happening close to them. So I mean, in Malaysia, just, just to quote one example, they're talking about nationwide regulations potentially being brought in as early as next March. In the UK, for example, as well, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, England, there's so many conversations about licensing schemes. And I know Fiona Campbell and, and the team with uh, Association of Scotland's Cell Caters are, are doing a great job in actually getting media coverage um, out for this and, and being a real voice for the industry. In the European Union, we're, we're talking about even talking about blanket rules across the whole block, which, again, I, I think... I'm not really quite sure how all of these different legislations would necessarily be brought in. And actually, as we were talking about uh, at SCIF just a few weeks ago, because I happen to be co-moderating a panel on on regulations, and it's really looking now at how we're going to um, establish these strategic regulatory frameworks as well and really communicating with with regulators and, and authorities and it, it could just be something as, as simple as actually showing the value that short-term rentals bring to the economy and it, it might have to be a sort of slight change of tact or different way of getting that message out there but we've definitely got to keep the communication going I think we've got to perhaps look at how we change wider public perception as well about this industry and emphasise perhaps how we we benefit communities mm-hmm. and neighbourhoods rather than just this myth, maybe we could we could say, that it, it, it's all take and it's all disruption. Um, it's, it's a valuable market and vertical in travel and hospitality that, that deserves respect as well and if a pandemic is anything to go by, then you know, the, the growth that we're seeing um, will only continue. And it, travel, I, I would say as well, is one of those things that it's one of those luxuries that people are not going to compromise or give up. Mm-hmm. People want to travel. There's always going to be opportunities out there. And um, it's, it's for us to take advantage of that, of that demand now. That is a great note to uh, to wrap up on, I think. You know, I, I think everybody that's involved in this industry needs to be involved, not just involved in their parochial level. <laughs> parochial. Coming, coming back to the start, yes. I, I love that word. Didn't I? <laughs> yeah, but, to, but to, to, to see what's happening outside of your own space and what what you're doing has an impact on other places and what, what's happening outside has an impact on on you. Paul, it's been absolutely great to chat again. I will look forward to seeing you in Orlando. Oh, in in UK next April. <laughs> yes, um thank you well thank you again Heather for, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure and honor to to be on the podcast and um here's to another 500 episodes as well. <laughs> oh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul Stevens from Short Term Rentals with a Z, with a Z, if you're in England. That means R-E-N-T-A-L-Z. I will put the link onto the show notes along with all the other links that I mentioned, we mentioned in this episode. Don't forget that, uh, you know, there is a full transcript now of the podcast on the show notes. We were asked for that for years. People said, you know, can you do as a transcript? And... We did research that, and the cost of doing transcripts was was just crazy. Now, of course, it is immediate. It's automatic. The moment we finish speaking, we have a full transcript all done by AI. Yeah, you can go. You can go read, read the transcript. I like it. I like reading transcripts of other podcasts. You know, you hear something, particularly if you're out on a walk or whatever, and you think, "Oh my gosh, what was that?" You don't want to go back and find that specific spot in the uh, in the episode that you're listening to, so you can go and find it and just scroll through a transcript. So I hope you enjoy those. 
And it does make sure that I put all the links that we mentioned because I can go through the transcript myself and find them and then put them in the show notes. I hope you enjoyed that. I go to short-term rentals at least once a week to read the latest news, you know, what's going on around the globe. And it does give that wider perspective for me as, as a broadcaster. It helps me to, to see the wider picture when I'm interviewing anybody. And it's, it's very helpful. And I think we should all get that wider perspective. So I'd just like to thank you for listening. I'm not sure I do this enough, this huge thank you that I want to give to all those of you who come along and listen every single week. I love to read your comments and feedback. I may not see them all because I know that people do feedback and write their reviews on different platforms that I may not see. But certainly I I look at the iTunes ones and it's very gratifying to know that people are actually out there listening and find what we're talking about to be useful. So, you know, if you feel like this is a good day to give a five star review, then I would love to get one. That's it for this week. And I, of course, look forward to being with you again. Stay safe, enjoy your day, and have fun. This episode was brought to you by the kind returning sponsorship of Onares. Don't forget, if you sign up, use the promotional code VRF30, that's VRF30, to get 30% off your first three months of usage of Onares, which is an internationally recognized leader in vacation rental software, And you can click the link in the description of this episode on your smart device or head over to vacationrentalformula.com forward slash ownerez to find out more. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.